Thanks, Al. Thanks for that warm introduction. Uh, <laughs> Look, it's not going to be easy. I'm, I've got to come up here on the back of um, Sue. Which, like, let's give her a round last week. Seems we're in clapping mode. <laughs> Man, we got to look into the, that beautiful face and now you've got this. So if I notice faces looking around me and to the side and at the plants, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Um, all right, I'll just get into this. Uh, <laughs> if, if you're someone who likes to have a title for the, for the things, if you're writing notes, I thought Preach Zilla would be appropriate. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that might help you. Um, so we must have had osmosis or something. I'm just replaying your message from last week. I've got to get into this. Okay, so I'll, I'll start. I, I've wrote here pray because I'm useless without it. And um, yeah, it's a good thing to do. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you um, set all my nerves. I've got a bit of the, the jingly jangles up here. Um, God, I know that I'll just give it my best, Lord, and that you'll do the work, Father. So, Lord, I pray this morning that uh, these words will be impactful, God, that um, you'll be glorified above all else in this. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to, to be up here and to share your, your gospel with people, Father, and I just pray, Lord, that um, people's hearts will be open to receive this word today, Lord. Amen. Okay. Well, I thought we'd start with um, a verse at Mark 14, 3 to 6. I'll get right into scripture. That's the best way to start for me or I'll get wandering. But um, it's this beautiful picture and it, I think we've all heard it a lot of times but it really struck me. I heard it about a month or so ago, Al was speaking and it just really hit me, this story of uh, Mary washing Jesus with perfume and it's about a week before he goes to the cross and um, I just think, you know, how many things would be running through anyone's mind at that time and yet Jesus had this this moment where his earthly years, they weren't the easiest, I reckon. It was a tough time to be around. And this woman come and just showed him love and um, made him feel really special in that moment. You know, he got to sit back and be loved by this woman. And um, I just think it's such a beautiful picture that someone did that for God and um, loved him in that way. So I'll read this verse if we can follow along with it. <clears throat> so it's Mark 14, verse 3. It says, While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, I was reading this and I was listening to this other guy speak about this and he, um, he stopped there and I thought it was pretty cool. He said, Look, check out the nickname this poor guy got, <laughs> Simon the Leper. I thought that was pretty funny. It seemed to really stick because <laughs> he said they wouldn't be in his house if he was still a leper, but he still carried the tag. I thought that was horrible. So they're reclining in the table of this leper, ex-leper, and a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It would have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. <clears throat> this is where our Jesus steps in and he says, leave her alone. He says, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And um, I just love that Jesus, as a man in that moment, found that to be such a beautiful thing that, that it was done to him out of just a loving heart. And um, I think that's what Mary shows us here. She... She worshipped God, but she used an act of love, and that's what our worship is, our love offering to God. And um, when we worship one, uh, you know, not worship one another, but when we love on one another, we're honouring God in worship. So um, I just have a bit of a sort of a rote question, but all this, I just want to disclaim that this applies to me as well. I'm, I'm saying this to myself, so don't think I'm high and mighty up here. Um, but I thought, does our worship feel like an act of sincere love? And um, an example, I mean, we just had worship together then in a musical form and, um, you know, it can get dangerous in these church formats that we start seeing things as routine and we just come in week after week and, you know, we're pretty lucky that we get every week we get to come and share as a family 20, 30 minutes where we get to praise God and worship and it can be a danger just to, to stop thinking, you know, this is my sincere love for Jesus and, and take it as routine 20 minutes and what's next. So just always value that and... Um, if we don't value it, we can take the impact away from it. Um, and I know like it's, sometimes it's not your thing, it mightn't be your, the greatest voice up there behind the mic or whatever, but God puts value on this time. He really values corporate worship. And like Al was just saying then in Acts, you know, when they got together in the early days, they were in one accord. And when we come together in unity, um, God puts a real value on that. And um, you know, that it, I've read, heard someone say, you know, corporate unity releases corporate breakthrough. And, you know, if we want to be a church that sees the miracles and sees these young kids, um, man, they're an awesome bunch too. I got to do kids' church the other week. That was really special, but I've got some stuff about that. But, you know, if we want to see these generational breakthroughs and these things in our, in our churches and in this region, 
you know, that corporate unity, come into this place expectant on Sundays and um, yeah, worship God with all your heart in that. Um, so to have a look at this passage, I've, I've got a few signals. That, <laughs> Ruth's fixing a mask, but a signal is rub the nose if I'm talking too fast. I've got Mark rubbing his nose and I've got Ruth. So <laughs> I'll slow it down. <laughs> I had two Pepsis this morning. Um, but um, if we observe this passage here, if we go to verse 4, this, this just jumped out at me. It says, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. Whoa. You know, if you put yourself in those shoes and think Jesus come into your house last night during that storm and sat back and reclined with you, and would you feel such a love that you could give him over a year's worth of your wages? Like, that's huge. I, I couldn't even imagine. But, you know, that's where Mary was at. And you've got to think, what got her to this point? You know, why was Mary so desperate to just fall at Jesus' feet and love him like that and, and a year's way, I can't get past that. <laughs> That's huge. Maybe money's an issue for me, but, you know, it is a big thing just to offer such an amount of yourself. And, um, yeah, so not to assume, but it seems Mary didn't wait to respond in expressing a love um, by waiting for the stars to align. You know, sometimes giving's a really hard thing and sometimes we can wait for this perfect moment, like, no, I'm not hearing it yet or not waiting or... Well, Mary, she just gave out of her heart because she loved Jesus in this moment. I don't think she was waiting around for this perfect moment. It was just she loved him. Um, but out of that, we know giving requires sacrifice. And we see here that Mary seized the moment to sacrifice her best offering to Jesus. It wasn't half-hearted. It wasn't coming in late. It wasn't, you know, it was, this is it. I'm coming here and Jesus is going to get it. And no matter what um, comes of it, no matter how she looked, because in that, in that environment, I can imagine that would have looked pretty crazy, um, but she just felt she had to show Jesus how much she loved him. Um, because of her actions, we still remember it today. And um, imagine if our worship was that sincere today that God would do this to our offerings and bless them in such a way that people would remember them in 2,000 years' time. That's pretty incredible. That's how much God values our worship to him. Um, a few weeks back, I was talking with Ruth and... Um, I was trying to navigate my around, way around how I seemed to get freed of tough times and trials. And this is touching a bit on what Sue spoke about last week, but I seem to get pulled back in a little bit or I, I feel like it's, it's grabbing a hold or a vine's got my leg. And I think one reason that we can look at in this verse and one reason why I believe this happens is that, um, you know, when we follow God beyond where we've gone with him before, it's going to start to require more time, more energy, more sacrifice and basically more cost of us. Um, we know God's ways are so different to our ways and God blessed this moment with Mary and her sacrifice, um, her dignity, the cost she chose to face because she knew the worth of who she was offering. Um, it says in 2 Samuel, 2, uh, 2 Samuel 24, it says, I will not offer the Lord that which costs nothing to me. So there's a value on our sacrifice to God. So just to bring a bit of me into this, and I just touched on that a little bit, I'm going to have to moonwalk back a couple of months. Um, and Alan was talking about Peter. I don't know if you remember that time. We went through a bit of a stage. We were talking about Peter. And um, I'm probably going to add a new season to my calendar from now on. We've got summer, autumn, winter, spring, and I'm adding Peter into the, the seasons because I think I went through it this year, and I'm sure a few of you might have found it tough as well. But, um, you know, a few months ago, I was sort of struggling a little bit, and um, Al was talking about Peter this morning. I, st I felt like I was in that, that time. It's was like I, I wanted the best. I wanted to stand up and lead a charge for God but it's like the, the, spilling, the spirit was willing and the, the flesh was weak I just couldn't get the energy, I couldn't get the motivation to, to really go hard for him and that's what I wanted but I kept falling short and uh, just feeling like I wasn't I just had nothing in me to go there And um, something Alan said, he said speaking about Peter, he said what if the sinking was an, as important a part of the process as the walking on water I'll just say that again because it really hit me. It said, what if the sinking was as important part of the process as the walking on the water? Um, yeah, I know for me in that time, there, like I just said, there was a lot of striving. There was a lot of like, well, I'll just press in harder or go harder, but it wasn't breaking me through. It ended up taking surrender. Um, I had to just surrender myself to what God was doing for the season I was in and accept that he's doing something in me, even if it's hard. Um, I reckon for me, if, if I was in Peter's shoes, I was, I was under the water in that situation. Like, I was sinking and probably the water was over my eyes. But if anyone had to come and said, do you want a hand? <laughs> I'd have just shooed him away. No, I'm fine. I got this. I got a snorkel in the back pocket. Like, you know, sometimes the pride's got to be put aside to let God do what he's going to do. And um, it's not easy. 
Um, I've been reading a book lately, and I won't read the whole thing to you, but um, <laughs> it's not that long. There is just a part, just speaking about Peter, that's really cool, and um, I just want to read that to you. So I think I'm going like a robot anyway, so it won't be much different. But it's pick, I'll pick it up here. It says, Peter was the one who declared Jesus to be the Christ and swore to die for the Lord. When Jesus was arrested, it was Peter who cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. But Satan had asked to sift him like wheat, and Peter was sifted. His strength failed, his zeal failed. In a moment, he denied everything he believed in, and the Lord looked right at him right after he did it. And this is the awesome bit. He says, speaking about Peter again, he says, you know Peter wanted a different story, like us in those situations. I'm sure it's not how he wanted to be remembered. He wanted to stand head and shoulders above his brothers. He wanted to be the guy who emerged from that sifting steadfast. But the greatest gift from that sifting was in his restoration. And Jesus asked Peter a simple question three times. It says in John 21, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And what else could Peter's broken heart reply but, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And I think that's such a beautiful picture that um, in that moment, all the zeal, all that strength and all that, you know, striving, it didn't even matter anymore. All he, all he knew he needed was that love that Jesus had for him. And, um, and Jesus looked at him and said, do you love me? And he, he had that answer still. It's something he still had in him. So... Um, yeah, so uncomfortable times, basically, is what my words are there, because I feel like that's what I went through. But um, I don't know if any of you have been to the Lismore Cinema. I'm sure we all have. Holy moly. <laughs> it gets uncomfortable. Those seats are uh, made of lead. <laughs> I've found myself upside down looking from the seat in front just to change my position. And sometimes that's what uncomfortable times force us to do. They force us to shift our position. And for me, it was a shift of mindset. It was a, a decision to stop striving in that. Um, we know trials are a part of life, but as Christians, when we get more revelation of the worth of Jesus to us, we can live with the cost of following him. Mary knew Jesus' worth. Um, so to give a bit of background on Mary, I'm sure you all know it, but um, if anyone does, I'll go there anyway because I have to touch up, to be honest. Um, so in John 12, you don't have to turn there, but it, it, um, that's, that's where Jesus is in this place reclining with Lazarus and Mary. Hang on, Lazarus. Sorry, I wanted to do a preacher moment. If you actually go to number 11 instead of 12. <laughs> Sorry, old classic. What was Lazarus doing there? I thought he had died. No, if we go back to John 11, um, we actually get to see how Mary's sacrifice was a response of gratitude. Um, where's my phone gone? Good grief. Here it is. It's the one verse I didn't write down. Um, John 11, verse 1 to 7. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And this verse too really gives away this. If it's a Hollywood blockbuster, this gives it away. It says, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So this sort of shows us straight away that Jesus already knew this family. They were friends. It says the one you loved is sick. So Jesus knew Lazarus as a friend. He must have known these sisters pretty well. Um, when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness will not end in death. Um, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And it says here, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. <laughs> That's a bit strange. Like she's asked him to come and help. You know, he's sick. Can you come and do something for him? And it says, and now he loved, loved them, but he stayed two more days. It's like, well, that's baffling. Wouldn't he go straight away and <laughs> try and fix this problem? But there was a reason, and it's that verse before where he says, it'll be for God's glory that this happens. So if we scroll down to verse 32, we actually find out Jesus waited four days. No, no it was two days, sorry. It already said that. I'm not going to lie here. But by the time he got there, Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. And... Um, when he gets back there, uh, he waits outside the village by the sounds of it and Martha comes out to him and she's pretty distraught. And you can only imagine, Mary didn't even come out at first. She stayed back um, mourning because they've lost their brother and I can, you can imagine her heart at this point. She's torn up and she's probably heartbroken. She's probably wondering, why didn't Jesus come back quicker? Um, eventually, Mary goes and um, Martha gets Mary to come out and she runs out to Jesus and... Um, it says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
So the, the fact that she came and she fell at his feet. So this is a pretty distraught woman. She's going through a lot and she just fell at his feet with nothing and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. So she still believed in who he was. In verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping um, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He said, Where have you laid him? And she said, Come and see, Lord, they replied. And it says in verse 35, Jesus wept. So he was so moved by this, this seeing humans... Um, pain and, and that for this situation. Um, in verse 38, it says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, take away the stone. Um, they said, no, don't do it. It's going to stink like high heaven in here. And um, he said, do it anyway. Um, <clears throat> so they took away the stone. And in, this is a cool bit. It says, Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I think, you know, Jesus, he had such a faith in God that, you know, he's got this. He already knew he can raise him from the dead, but he wanted to make sure that the people saw it. That was a worship, Jesus worshipping God in that moment to show how powerful he is and to make sure people saw that act of worship as uh, God's power at work. Um, Boy, I'm lost here. So I want my life to have meaning. You know, I want it to point others to God um, and to, for, for people to know the God I know. You know, sometimes you just say, I want people to know God, but we all know in our hearts who God is to us and we see that loving Father, that, that strong God he is, and I want people to know that, but um, I want to have impact down here. And I, I think Jesus lived a life full of Im- impact. Even before the cross, there was something so attractive about his life and the encounters he had with people. His impact made people respond. We see it in Mary now. We've seen from that story that Mary, she responded. She got shown love and then she gave love in return with Jesus. Um, We saw it with the disciples, like Al said, you know, the early church were were meeting together, eating together, praying together, praising together. Um, But they got all that off a a foundation that was set before them by by Jesus. You know, they they learned and they did. yeah, in Acts 2.42, oh, that's where that was, if you want to look it up. But yeah, these guys continued the work of Jesus. After they were chosen by him, we see new believers that were out of daily, building the kingdom, living praising. I just covered that. The Bible says we love because he first loved us, and that's what we see in these situations. God showed us love, and then love was shown in return. I want to encourage us to make a decision to come to a place where love is the foundation for what we do for Jesus. We're all here to serve and honour God, and he wants our foundations to be strong. Um, If we can have a look at Matthew 7, verse 24. Give that a second. I might have a sip of water. I saw Sue do this. It was a great way to calm down. I don't even know whose water that is, but (laughs) it's under there. It's very refreshing. (laughs) Thanks, Sue. Okay, um, so Matthew seven twenty four, it says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So you read that anyone who hears. It's not for special people. This is for all of us. Anyone who hears the words of Jesus and does them is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, it sort of backs that up. Um, and this is Paul. He's talking to the church that he, he started off, I guess. Yeah, it says, by the, grace of God, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone is building upon it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. It goes on to say what you build with will be tested and manifest. So this makes it pretty clear we're all called to be kingdom builders, each one of us. And because we're building something eternal, something precious, it actually matters how we build into ourselves and how we build into others. Um, And I underline in that verse, it says, but each one should build with care. You know, that's emphasised. I'm reading reading backwards here. So I know that sounds all pretty heavy stuff, what I've just said, but um, sometimes we see ministry opportunities or co-workers in need and... um, I don't know, I'm the, this is I'm speaking to myself, we're sort of worried that we'll stuff it up, we'll get it wrong, and so we end up doing nothing. Um, I just want to say from personal experience, like God is bigger than our mistakes, so don't be too worried about that. Um, as long as we're building into the kingdom, as long as we're doing what, what we're here to do for God, you know, he'll take care of the, the bigger picture. 
Um, some of my building materials over the years have been paddle pop sticks and zinger burgers. <laughs> you know, he's still doing something. Um, I'm pretty sure I've heard the devil whisper Jenga in my ear a few times now, so um, the whole thing could come down, but it, it won't because it's built on a foundation. Um, so like Mary, let's let our love and affection for God be infectious. If you've accepted Jesus into, into your heart, you have a rock-solid foundation. Um, I'll get, I know this is a short one today, but I'll get the band to come up. and um, Still a bit to go, but be a nice mood. Um, I just wanted to share my testimony. I know there's a few new faces here from probably the last time I spoke and shared my testimony, but um, just speaking of foundations... Uh, for me, this is just that rock-solid moment in my life that nothing can shake. And um, I was 19 years old, and um, I was living in this area just a bit out of town, and life was sort of on the free fall a little bit. I'm not going to say I was a lost cause, but it was not going great for me. And mentally, I think I was really struggling and um, felt like I was losing a grip. And I think as Christians, we got this bedrock, we got this foundation where no matter when we fall, we land on those testimonies. That's how powerful our testimonies are. I didn't have that before. I just kept falling. I didn't know how to stop it. And um, I got to this point one night where I just said, you know what? I don't even know if I said, you know what? I just cried out, basically. <laughs> it was a lot more desperate than some nice words. It was just, please, I know you've, I've seen you be real to, to Ruth. My friends seem to think you're real. Can you be something to me? And, um, you know, that night, I, I know for a fact, I saw Jesus. I can't picture his face, but this bright light. And I know it was him just coming to my room. I slept out on an old veranda at a farmhouse we had. And... He come in right at the end and like within a blink he was next to me. I've heard a lot of people say this but I saw a hand held out and um, if for me it just, it just broke me but at the same time it has held me strong um, for the last 15 years. I've, I've not been able to fall beyond it and I've had some falls and I've had some messy times but that's the strength in a good foundation and that's for all of us. Go back to those testimonies, land on them. Um, I, w I know without a doubt that no matter how wrong I get it, I'll never f fall beyond that night when I met Jesus. I know that when trials come and it's hard yakka, if it restores my heart to him, then that's okay. You know, that's how I felt in that last time I went through this year. I just, I actually just felt so grateful that, you know what, this was a sucky season of Peter. But at the end of the day, I actually felt like my relationship with God got a little bit of a jump start and um, I felt like it was that night again where I got to be back with him. He took all the mess and I actually felt it. I felt like he just threw my burdens into his fields of grace and said, you know, come back to me. And um, I hadn't felt that way for a long time, but it just felt so amazing to come back to purity. And um, I'm going to mess up again, but I know I can keep landing on that spot. And um, to speak at kid, Kids Church a couple of weeks ago with Nick, you know, we had to make a two-metre gap with them because they were pretty wild, but um, it was just beautiful seeing these kids, just hearts just open for God. They didn't care less what anyone thought of them. They just all grabbed a maraca and a shaker and whatever they had. I think one kid grabbed another kid and, and <laughs> shook him. It was, it was innocent, <laughs> but it was beautiful just seeing the purity in their worship. And um, I saw a little Abby down on her knees on the floor. It, it really... I think it said something to me and I just, I want to see that in us, you know, I want to see it in me, I want to, I want to be open with my God and um, he sees everything, I just want to be here and love him for who he is and like those children just come with an honest heart and sincerity. Um, I just want to finish today by saying to anyone here today, if you want to come into or come back to a place where Jesus is your first love, if you're struggling, if you're like me, you're in a season that's just doing your head in. Um, just know how much he loves you his arms are open wide his voice is calling your name um, maybe he's calling you into something exciting and new with him right now or maybe he's just waiting back at the start where you first met him with his arms open where you first felt his love and he wants to be your first love again just hold on to those foundations in Jesus and you'll never fall beyond it we're gonna I just I hope this doesn't come across as an item I want to invite you guys in to come and, and just be a part of this with us and just set your heart on Jesus and just say be my first love again um, I just want to read this verse first and uh, I'll pray at the end of it it's from Psalm 18 verse 1 it says I love you Yahweh and I'm bonded to you my strength Yahweh you are the bedrock beneath my feet my faith fortress my wonderful deliverer my God my rock of rescue where none can reach me you're the shield around me the mighty power that saves me and my high place all I need to do is call on you Yahweh the praiseworthy God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, from the bottom of my heart, God, for what you did for me. 
no. 15 years ago, God, you know, I felt like Lazarus. You brought me back. You gave me hope. You gave me life, Lord, and I'll forever be grateful, Lord. Lord, I pray that if my worship to you um, ever gets muddy, Lord, if it ever gets agenda-driven, Lord, God, can you bring me back into a place of purity where I just fall at your feet and just wash you with my worship, Lord Jesus. I just pray for all of us here, God. We love you so much. Lord, life, you know life's hard down here and we get distracted, we get pulled from side to side. But God, we want to be a generation that makes your name known down here. We want to have impact, Lord God. And I just pray that you'll just pour out blessing on each person here today, Lord. God, let us hear your voice clearer. Lord, let us see your tender love and let us know that we can run into your arms like children, Father, and just be in your purity with you, Lord Jesus. I just thank you so much for who you are, Lord, and I just, I'll never let go of who you are. Thank you so much, Jesus. Amen.